Here on KGRA Radio, welcome to the Richard Dolan Show, where every week we fight the good fight. Greetings. My guest for this program is Peter Davenport. Peter is the director of the National UFO Reporting Center and has been doing that since 1994. If you see a UFO anywhere, uh, I mean, it's interesting for you, I suppose, but it doesn't do the rest of us any good if we don't know about it. And the best place to go and has been the best place for years is the National UFO Reporting Center. Uh, Peter runs this site. It's, there's a massive database. We'll talk all about that. Um, and I'm, I've known Peter for years. I'm just really excited to have him on. He uh, did his undergraduate education at Stanford University in California, got a bachelor's in Russian and biology and a translator certificate in Russian language. He did graduate work at the University of Washington in Seattle, got a master's degree in the genetics um, and biochemistry of fish, a whole other area there, uh, from the College of Fisheries, and then got an MBA in finance and international business from the Graduate School of Business there. He's been a college instructor. He's been a commercial fisherman. He's been a Russian translator in the Soviet Union, a fisheries observer aboard Soviet fishing vessels. How about that? A flight instructor in gliders and has run his own business. He actually was a president of a Seattle-based biotech company that had over 300 scientists and technicians. He's run for the Washington State Legislature. He was a candidate for the U.S. House of Representatives. And he's interested in UFOs because he had a sighting as a young man. We'll talk about that too. Peter Davenport is one of these people in the UFO field that you really want to know what he thinks about this subject. He's one of the best positioned individuals that we have. Peter, it is a pleasure to have you on here. How are you, sir? I'm doing well, and thank you for the kind words in the opening statement. And I'm looking forward to working with you, Richard. This is, I admire you. I admire your work tremendously, and it's a real pleasure to be able to be doing an interview with you. I'm looking forward to this. Same here. Well, we've known each other a long time. We've always gotten along well, and I uh, think it's it's past due that we've done this. Um, as far as where we want to start, you you have such a uh, a deep background in the subject of UFOs. Maybe uh, you can tell people a little bit about what the National UFO Reporting Center is, um, the kind of sheer volume that you deal with there, and, and in general, what, what the story is at that website. Yeah, it's an interesting institution, Richard. Uh, the National UFO Reporting Center was founded in October of 1974 by a retired Seattle fireman. Robert J. Gribble was his name. Mm -hmm. He was a member of MUFON. He was on the board of directors, I believe, of MUFON. And he argued, when he retired, he argued that what we really needed in ufology was a, a central clearinghouse where people could call shortly after a report, after a sighting, and report their sighting to an authority who would then file it and categorize it and use the material beneficially. So that was the beginning of it. I took over the reins from Bob Gribble in uh, 1994, 20 years after he'd founded it. Yeah. And what we do is provide, as I mentioned earlier, provide a clearinghouse for reports, much like what MUFON does, Mutual UFO Network, although MUFON is much more capable of performing in-depth, detailed investigations. We are not. I would equate the difference between the National UFO Reporting Center and the Mutual UFO Network. Uh, my organization is more like the police blotter in a local newspaper whereas MUFON is more of the court reporter. There, there's more data, more facts to deal with. You both do important work here, and you both take in five, 6,000 or more reports a year. I mean, it's a staggering number. Uh, I recall yes. a couple of years ago, you were up over 8,000 reports, I believe. Um, it's dipped a little bit, but you're for, still really high. For one year, yeah. Yeah. And the really astonishing thing, Richard, is... In my opinion, 
based on 25 years of work, I argue that we are capturing only about one out of somewhere between 10,000 and 20,000 UFO sightings in the United States. Wait, wait, wait. Um, one out of 10,000 or one out of yes. 20,000? That lower percentage? I estimate that out of somewhere between 10,000 and 20,000 people who see what they sincerely believe was a UFO, only one of those people will ever make a call to an organization like mine or like MUFON and will actually follow through with a written report. It underscores how many people or how many sightings there are uh, annually. Just That's multiply incredible. what I do, 8,000 a year times 20,000 or even 10,000 or even, let's say, 1,000 to be conservative. You're talking uh, tens of millions of sightings a year. If that's that the case. is my that is my impression based on the work I've done. The Phoenix Lights, the celebrated Phoenix Lights case, yes, March thirteenth, nineteen ninety seven, is an example. Uh, those five or possibly six objects loitered over Phoenix and surrounding communities and neighboring states for well over two hours, mm -hmm. and all told, we have collected about fifteen hundred reports. How many people may have seen those craft uh, back in March of 97? God only knows, but uh, only about 1,500 of them have ever uh, reported it. Well, your point then, it's important for listeners to understand that you're not saying uh, millions or tens of millions of distinguished events per year, but that many witnesses. So there could be large numbers of witnesses to any given sighting, I think, is what you're, same you're implying. Same thing, exactly. Yeah, exactly. They may have seen the same thing. The, the Battle of Los Angeles is another case in point. Sure. Um, millions, I suspect, certainly hundreds of thousands, possibly millions of people. I don't know what the population of the greater Los Angeles area was in 1942, but uh, as far as I know, we don't have one documented report in our database from actual eyewitnesses. So that gives us another data point on how few people actually report even very dramatic sightings. Right. It's a really good observation. Because with the Battle of LA, that was quite, quite dramatic. Maybe there were, I don't know, a million residents of Los Angeles at that time. I'm just guessing here, but... Yeah. Um, Unfortunately, a lot of them were woken up out of uh, the middle of the night for that. But I think that there were many witnesses indeed, quite a few. Yeah, I, yeah. I actually met a gentleman in Seattle who as a youngster saw the events associated with that, that occurrence. And he said it was dramatic. Ah. The, and he, he saw the actual disc hovering in the night sky. I did everything in my power to get him to write it down. And like most people, he did not want to do so or did not end up writing it down. So all of that precious, precious information and data is lost. I had an old uh, friend who's unfortunately no longer with, with us, uh, Professor Scott Littleton, taught within the uh, University of California system for years, was a young witness at the time. I think he was about eight or nine, was out with his mother. She took him outside. He didn't see the disc clearly, but he did write about it. I have I have that book, um, which is a valuable testimony, but yeah. I agree there's many who have not. May I ask you, uh, I want to get into some of the cases you have on your site and your thoughts, but you yourself were a UFO witness when you were a, a young person back in 1954, and I didn't know about this, but uh, it's quite interesting. And maybe you could tell people about this. Oh, yeah. I'd love to talk about it. Like, I see most people who call the hotline love to talk about their sighting. It right. seems to be uh, embedded in our souls to do that. But mm -hmm. the, the reason that I am on this program speaking to Richard Dolan about UFOs is because of a sighting that lasted perhaps 10, maybe 15 seconds back in, I believe it was July of 1954, I was born and raised in St. Louis, Missouri. 
my father worked out at the airport. He was the station manager for a, a major American airline there. And uh, one night he had to work in his office. So my family of four, my father, mother, my older brother, and I drove out to the airport. We dropped my father off on the north side of the airport. And my mother, brother, and I then drove around to the south side to attend a drive-in theater. Back in the 50s, there was a very popular drive-in theater there. Well, we were watching a movie. It was totally dark, so I presume it was 9 or 10 o'clock at night. A disturbance started brewing in the, the theater. We didn't know what was going on. We didn't know whether it was a fire or a fight or somebody was injured. Something along those lines was occurring. And people were getting out of their cars and walking to the uh, north, to the to our right. And I looked out the right window of our family car, a 53 Studebaker, <clears throat> and there was the most amazing craft I've ever seen in my life. It was the shape of a rugby ball. Mm -hmm. That is what what a mathematician would call a prolate spheroid like a football. Yes. And it was blood red and it was extremely bright and it was approximately the size of a full moon in the night, night sky. So it was a very prominent object. You couldn't miss it. It was illuminating not just the theater, but as I remember, Richard, it was illuminating the whole airport, bathing the airport in red light. And I had unusually good vision as a kid and not only that but i was very skilled at uh, spotting and identifying aircraft having a father in the airline business that sure. was sort of part of the deal right and i had never in my life seen anything like that and it suddenly accelerated almost instantaneously accelerated streaked across the sky following an sort of a sigmoid or S-shaped curve across the night sky. It streaked to the northwest, went right across McDonnell Aircraft Corporation, and was gone from sight. All of what I've described here occurred in approximately 10 seconds, I would estimate. That's Maybe half that. Could you ha but, have an idea of how uh, high the altitude, <clears throat> excuse me, the altitude of that object was? Have no idea. Uh, have no idea how hmm. high it was, except to say that it was just above the horizon from my vantage point. I would say perhaps 10 degrees angle of elevation above the horizontal plane. But if I were to see something like that today, I would collect the information and do the triangulation, draw straight lines to find out where it was when I was looking at it uh, from two or more points and uh, research it, investigate it. But yeah. I was six and a half years of age at the time. So oh, my. <laughs> I didn't think about such things then. Well, as a father of two now young adults, I remember when they were six. And one thing that I definitely learned is that by the time you're even that age, you've definitely got the ability to make observations. Uh, oh, yeah. You may not be able to... Uh, figure out technically what it is you're seeing, but you know what you're seeing at that age. So uh, yeah. I do consider that important. And obviously it was life, uh, well, had a deep imprint on you for the remainder of your life. Yep. Uh, how and interesting. I think it is arguable that the reason I am the director of the National UFO Reporting Center today is because of that 10 second long event uh, back in 1954. I wish, I suspect that there are people still alive today who are in that theater. My hope is someday somebody will submit a report to supplement what I have written uh, in my report. Yes, indeed. I would love, I, I always criticize people who are looking to speak with other people who've seen the same thing they did, but uh, here I'm doing exactly the same thing uh, that the people do whom I criticize, but, but we can't help it, it was quite exciting. Can't help it. You know, actually, one of the things about your site that I love, I think many people appreciate, and by the way, please go to the 
um, telling people to go to the National UFO Reporting Center. Um, it's www.newfork.org. I, I'm doing this from memory, but I, I go there frequently enough. Or is it newfork.com? Uh, let me interject something. UFOcenter.com takes them to the same website, and it's a little bit easier to remember. Just UFOcenter.com. UFOcenter.com. I'm looking at it. That's- I'm looking at that in one of your uh, documents here. So uh, I always go to the the other one and never even notice. But it's a it's a great site. But one of the I was going to mention that something that I love about your site are the reports of people who've written long after the fact of early sightings. I mean, some of these go back to the 1930s or perhaps even earlier. Uh, It's quite fascinating. You know, people after decades and decades still have the opportunity to write to, uh, to put their story on your site. And there's a few that I actually find quite interesting. And I know you've collected a number, even from the 1930s, or the 1950s. Are there any of those that stand out in your mind that you'd be interested in talking about? Yeah, there are many sightings. In fact, I've made a short list of about 50 or 60, maybe 70, Mm -hmm. of the really most dramatic, most well-documented cases for which the observer was a, uh, appeared to be, to me, to be a qualified person, a qualified observer and capable, reliable person. Uh, you mentioned sightings in the 30s. One comes to mind in particular. It occurred up in Alaska in this very close to the city of Eklutna, E-K-L-U-T-N-A, mm-hmm. Eklutna, Alaska, which is located just east of uh, Anchorage. And one day back in uh, the year 2000, I was sitting in my apartment in Seattle and the phone rang. It was a Saturday morning. And the gentleman said, uh, Mr. Davenport, sit yourself down because I'm going to tell you a story. <laughs> well, I cringe when people say that because my time is precious to me. But I'm glad I sat and listened to this gentleman. He was a teenager during the 1930s, and he was part of the CCC. Uh, I think I have those initials right. Yes, the Civilian uh, and, Conservation Corps under President yeah. Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Exactly. And yes. I didn't realize it at the time, but I've learned since that the CCC was intended for teenagers, mostly males, to be separated from the WPA. I think I have those initials right. Oh, the uh, labor, the labor group. Yes. To de-radicalize and, them, I'm guessing. Yeah, they... They did oh. that intentionally to keep the teenagers away from the older men so they didn't start uh, talking about communism. Well, this gentleman was a carpenter up in Eclipta, and they had only one day off. They worked six days a week. Sunday was their only day off. And this young gentleman was in the habit of hitchhiking into, into Anchorage for a night on the town. How much night of a, on the town you could have in 1930 or 30, this was 1936? I don't know, but that's what he did. And maybe maybe more than today. I mean, after all, he was hitchhiking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, and he uh, started hitchhiking from a Klitna, from their camp uh, on a Saturday night, and it was getting very cold. They weren't properly dressed for it. And they were hoping a truck would come by and pick them up. They looked to the west towards Anchorage, and they saw a very bright light coming at them. And it warmed their hearts because they were really ready to stop their trip and go back to the camp. It was so cold. Mm -hmm. So uh, the light got closer, and then they realized it was a craft, but it was silent. And uh, it looked like... The bottom of it looked like a flat iron. And they were so frightened by what they saw that they both jumped in a snow pile. And after it was finally gone, God only knows how long it hovered in the sky in their proximity, they both ran the entire distance back to the camp. Amazing. Yeah, that, if 
people read no other report but that one on our website, uh, that will share with them uh, just how dramatic some of these sightings become. I love these types of reports. I mean, love in the sense of they're uh, up close, personal, and they are old. Uh, something from Alaska in 1936, clearly nobody has any uh, idea of what kind of technology was in existence at the time to produce anything like that. So yeah. that's why it's just so fascinating. And even if it had been a terrestrial aircraft, it would have had a radial piston engine, so it would have been very loud. Absolutely. But they said it was totally silent. Oh, wow. So when it, it came, it, they, they thought it was a truck at first because they, it was low, I suppose. But as it approached, they realized it was not on the ground but above the ground. And they got a pretty good look at it, it sounds like. Yep, very good look at it. It was hovering directly above them. And it's occurred to me many times that it may have been an early abduction scenario. But we'll never know the answer to Interesting. that question. Uh, I don't want to take away from uh, the stories you have, but I'll just mention, and only briefly in passing, uh, on one occasion I found a, a Canadian report from 1936 in the Canadian National Archives from an even more remote area than um, Alaska, uh, way, way up in the Northwest Territories, and a guy who was a young man at the time who was doing aerial mapping for the Canadian government up in the vast wilderness of infinite lakes, uh, where he had an aircraft that yeah. would land on the water. He had a sighting. In, um, uh, he didn't give the month, but it seemed like good weather, so maybe May, June, July of 1936, middle of nowhere, yeah. of an object that he saw above him and instantaneously just took off. So they're out, they're, those stories are back there, and they're fascinating. Any other interesting stories from the past that you like reviewing? Yeah, another one that I would like to cite it, too, is from the 1930s. I, parenthetically, let me say, Richard, that I really, I, like you, really like to read past sighting reports from decades in, in the past because usually, I observe, they're submitted by serious-minded people who've had this, this memory festering in their minds and they just have an urge, feel an urgency to get it out of them. Yes. and record it for posterity's sake. Another one from the 30s that people can see on the ufocenter.com website is from 1937 down in the Los Angeles area. Uh, I think it might have been Valencia, where they grow oranges. Mm -hmm. A young fellow was walking home from a late-night movie, and he was suddenly illuminated from above by something he... Uh, had no idea what it was until he looked up and saw a craft. And it scared him so badly that he started running, and he hunkered down under at the base of an uh, orange tree, I think he says in his report. And this object came above him, and then it really turned its bright lights on. He said, I believe he comments in his report that he'd never seen lights that bright. It's another good report. I spoke with him at length on the telephone, and I was satisfied that this young, well, he was no longer a young fellow. He was, mm -hmm. In the 1990s, he was a septuagenarian, at least maybe an octogenarian. And I was convinced that he was telling the truth. It's a lovely report. What's fascinating... But those are, oh, I'm ahead. so sorry. Well, we're, we're going to take a break in two minutes or so, but I just... I like hearing these uh, stories from the 30s for another reason, which is just to remind all of us that we often think of the UFO phenomenon really taking off in the 1940s. But the, the more you go back into these early reports, you see that that's not true. They're not just anomalies. It's not just that there's one or two of these early reports out there. Actually, they're seem to have been quite a lot. Most are lost to us because simply there was not a reporting mechanism. I mean, be people would have something that they'd seen, they had nowhere to go. So it seems like the vast majority of sightings from the 30s, probably the 20s and earlier, are just gone to us. 
And, you know, we do have stories going back through the decades, even earlier than that and into the 19th century. But uh, I, f I find it's just very difficult to pull them out and bring them into the light of day because they're, they're just gone, you know, unfortunately. So, yeah. Peter, I couldn't agree more with the statement. And we'll talk about some of the, what primitive peoples must have thought if they saw a UFO a hundred or a thousand or 10,000 years ago, yeah. it must have been a momentous event in their lives. And I wish we could go back and talk to them to get their stories. You and me both. Look, let's take a very quick break. I'm Richard Dolan here with my guest, Peter Davenport of the National UFO Reporting Center here on KGRA Radio. We will be right back. I'm Richard Dolan here with my guest, Peter Davenport of the National UFO Reporting Center. Peter, welcome back. Thank you, Richard. So I really, to be here. <laughs> this is great. I love talking about these early cases. Maybe um, there's a lot of things that you have that really engage you in this subject. Uh, maybe before we get into a couple of more recent cases, did you want to talk about uh, this kind of neat idea that you have had for quite some time about, I guess, how to uh, detect or track using, I think, what you call passive radar for detecting yep. UFOs. Did you want to talk about that? Oh, I'd love to talk about yeah. it. And thank you for opening the door to that subject, Richard. It is, uh, I suspect that people, when they know me and know my passion for UFOs, would say, well, Peter's greatest contribution is all those cases that he has collected and posted on his website. I think there are about 135 or 136,000 cases in our database, and about 125 of those are posted. But in point of fact, my opinion is my greatest contribution to the UFO <laughs> phenomenon is not all of those cases. It is my proposal for a system for detecting UFOs directly. Passive radar capitalizes on the fact that when a commercial radio or television station broadcasts its signal, it goes out in all directions. And if there's something above it in the sky or out, even outside the atmosphere, that radio wave would be reflected back down to Earth. Mm -hmm. And the short version, the short description of my proposal is we could build a listening system with radio receivers. We don't have to broadcast a signal. The radio or television stations we're monitoring do that for us and listen for those signals, and it would detect anything within 1,200 or so miles of the listening station. When I, I well, in 1990, no, 2004 it was, I was invited to speak at the MUFON Symposium mm -hmm. that was going to be held in, uh, uh, I think, Denver that year. And I decided to write a paper, make a presentation at that uh, symposium that would be altogether different from what I'd done up to that point. And I wrote this paper on using passive radar for detecting UFOs. MUFON published it. I think it hit the Internet on the 6th of July, 2004. That day, I remember the date, Richard, because that day I got a call from a gentleman who worked in the CIA, or at that time worked in the CIA, and he, he called and introduced himself and said he knew me, but I probably didn't know him. He was correct in that, and he said, I am calling to congratulate you on your line of reasoning in your paper. He said, I am a Ph.D. physicist. The first 20 years of my career with the CIA, I devoted to building passive radar systems for the CIA for clandestine detection of targets. He said... Uh, you, if you build the system that you describe in your paper, you will be successful in answering the question of whether UFOs are present in our environment or not. 
He did not say you would detect them. He said you will answer the question of whether they are real or not. And what I do you think he was implying? Well, he was probably responding to a very strict uh, security right. oath he took in going into the CIA. He was suggesting, but not stating overtly, that uh, if we build a system, we would probably be detecting UFOs. Well, I thought the same thing, and my guess is, how many UFOs do you think the CIA has detected in exactly this manner over the years, right? Well, in... Yeah, I would say they probably detect hundreds or thousands a day. That is uh, a statement. That's a tall statement, but it's predicated on a great deal of work, as you know, and a great deal of data that's been collected. The plan for this but, is on your website, correct? Yes. Yeah. If people would like to read my 16-page paper on the subject, it's on our homepage at ufocenter.com. All right, good. Wow, fascinating. But, yeah. I think, you know, I'd heard you talk about this once before, but I have to honestly say, I don't think that I fully appreciated the, um, I guess, the magnitude of the idea. And it really does sound like it's got um, tremendous potential. And to get the kind of feedback that you got on it, uh, just seems to me it's absolutely worth proceeding is it something that would be expensive how how would it how would it proceed in terms of money yep. in terms of resources and so on good question and surprisingly inexpensive by my measure uh, I have a engineering team and a chief engineer and his estimate is that maximum cost for the prototype, would be between half a million and a million dollars. If we could find somebody who could provide uh, computer code writers, mm -hmm. uh, coders, uh, probably we could do it for a quarter of a million dollars. But the big expense is not the radio receivers or not the antennas. The big expense for the system is the computer code that has to be written. The engineering team that I've put together estimates that it would amount to about two million lines of code. But those those lines of code would allow us not only to detect an object, but to determine its location and to be able to track it uh, even at high speed. So it's a very exciting project. I get so excited about it, I lose a bit of my eloquence in trying to get it across to other people. But if anybody knows anybody who would be interested in helping fund such an effort, uh, I would love to talk to them. I have a feeling that the United States uh, national security community has multiple platforms by which they do this. I, I would exactly. actually be willing to bet a lot of money that this is exactly what they do. Exactly. I would think so. And mm -hmm. in point of fact, you're correct, Richard. It was the U.S. Navy that was assigned the responsibility for uh, protecting the southern tier of the United States. And they had, until three or four years ago, they had a radar system that capitalizes capitalized on the use of passive radar. It was called the Naval Space Surveillance System. Uh-huh. And... I once called the commanding headquarters of uh, that system. It was located in Georgia, I think Fort Stewart, Georgia, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, I was direct. I explained to the <laughs> to the switchboard who I was, and he directed me to a young public affairs officer in uh, the Navy. And I described with whom I would like to speak, and she said she couldn't couldn't connect me with the party I wanted to speak with, and there was no point in my ever calling back. <laughs> That's a pretty tall wow. statement for a, a young ensign to be making to a total stranger over the telephone, but it was clear they didn't want to talk to me. Yeah. And one final point about the Navy's surveillance system. This is the system <clears throat> that they use for tracking not only satellites, but space debris. 
And, of course, how many times have we heard the government brag that they can detect something down as small as a packet of cigarettes in space? And are we to believe that they can detect a packet of cigarettes maybe a few inches on a side, but they are not able to detect a disc maybe 30 or 60 or 120 meters in diameter? Of course they do. And they've been doing that since the late 1950s. I'm convinced of it. So that's what I would like to do. And uh, if anybody has any ideas as to, as to funding, I would love to uh, talk with them. I've been to five billionaires to discuss my proposal, and they all have expressed interest in it, but they've declined funding it. Wow. Well, I think that uh, the amount of money you're talking about may be, it's not pocket change, but I think if there are benefactors who are very much engaged in the UFO subject, this is a worthwhile thing to look into. So I'm glad we talked about that. Hey, I want people to know, um, I don't know how much time we want to spend on this because there's some more recent cases you've got that I'm, I'm curious about, but people ought to know that you are a genuine authority on the Phoenix Lights um, sighting, of course, of uh, March 1997. You really took all, and you mentioned this briefly earlier in this conversation, but I I know that you have a great deal to say about that. And also you are uh, quite, well, there's a few other high-profile events. The the death of uh, Mr. Todd Cease, which you and I actually have spoken about in other oh, yes. contexts together, it's a, a horrible, grisly uh, case, a disappearance, and then a, um, they eventually did find his body. It was in Pennsylvania. Um, maybe we can come back to that or circle around. But I do wonder, there were a couple of other uh, cases moving closer toward the modern era that just struck me as fascinating. Uh, for example... You have a number of sightings of egg-shaped objects from around 20 years ago, or in the year 2000, very similar yes. to how people describe uh, the Tic Tac UFO. I mean, roughly, not exactly. Yeah. I w- and there's, yeah, a, there's I- an amazing triangle sighting. Actually, I've had quite a few of those. Can you describe uh, this uh, one of these egg-shaped object sightings that uh, you have in your site? Yeah, the egg-shaped... Uh craft that you allude to, Richard, brings the brings one, uh, one report to mind immediately, and that's a report from the Rhode Island area, Providence, Rhode Island. Mm-hmm. It came to me from a young uh, commercial pilot, airline pilot. I think he was 26 at the time, but he described a very dramatic event. It was the 22nd of June, year 2000. So almost the longest day of the year. And uh, he was flying from Nantucket up to Manchester, New Hampshire, which is in the southeastern corner of New Hampshire. And he had to skirt his way around Boston because of heavy weather in the Boston area. So he diverted his flight out west of Boston, and he was headed northwest in the vicinity of Providence, Rhode Island. Okay. Well, as he was flying to the northwest, he glanced up ahead of his aircraft, and on the horizon, there was an object, a small object that he initially perceived to be a soaring bird, and his aircraft was at 7,500 feet. So uh, he glanced down into his cockpit for a moment to check something and glanced back to make sure that his aircraft was going to clear this obstruction when he realized that it was streaking at his aircraft and it was on a collision course with him. He said, he admitted to me that it was the worst fear he'd ever had in a cockpit because Mm -hmm. he thought he was on a collision course with something solid. Well, the object streaked by his aircraft, he estimates that it passed within 50 vertical feet of his aircraft underneath his starboard or right wing. And it shook him up for a few seconds, but he got on the radio and called Air Route Traffic Control Center, 
and asked them if they had anything in proximity to his aircraft. And they initially, and I have the audio on this, audio and the radar. Initially, the air traffic controller said, no, we don't see anything anywhere near you. A few seconds later, that same air traffic controller got back on the radio and said, yeah, now we see it, and it has just reversed course and is trailing your aircraft. A very dramatic sighting. And I've talked to this pilot a number of times since that initial conversation, and he's very convincing. He's, he's a professional pilot, mm -hmm. and it was a dramatic event. I have not looked at the radar because the catch-22 about radar data is you need the hardware to be able to play the diskette to reconstruct the uh, the events. And I don't, the one catch-22 that the FAA keeps in its hip pocket is they don't make that equipment available to the likes of me. I also so, would bet that a lot of the older equipment just gets revised, so probably the old radar data might almost be impossible to play back. Is that, would that be accurate? could be a possibility. Yeah. I'm not at all familiar with FAA hardware, so it's hard for me to answer in any kind of meaningful way. But it was clear that they were not going to make equipment available for my plane, the diskette, that would allow us to recreate those blips on a radar screen. You know, it's interesting. Um, my wife Tracy and I met a gentleman who is also a private pilot, very qualified. And um, very similar kind of a sighting, now that I think of it. You described this gentleman saw a dark or black egg-shaped uh, type of object zooming by. Well, this pilot uh, who spoke to us, very soft-spoken, very articulate man, was flying across the Atlantic in a um, very, um, I cannot remember exactly, but it was a very high-quality uh, private jet uh, from the UK to across the Atlantic to the United States. And the, he was co-pilot, but the pilot went out to use the bathroom, the loo. And so this guy is just flying on his own. And he saw below him at an unbelievable speed a disc, a dark disc-shaped object zooming by. Um, low off to the left. Came back, the, uh, the pilot came back and he told him and the pilot uh, essentially said, oh, another one. Uh, he had seen a lot of these. <laughs> But it, the description yeah. was not that different. And, you know, asking this pilot uh, the speed that he described, he said, look, uh, this is beyond anything that he could imagine. And, and it was like a either an egg-shaped or flying saucer-shaped type of object, like similar to what you're describing. So a little more recent, I think, but still quite interesting. These are out there. These objects are out there. Yeah, and they're more than just out there, they're in here. I think they're in our atmosphere and in proximity yeah. to the earth on a regular basis. You asked about recent cases. Another one that came to mind is at the bottom of page two of the list I sent you by email, mm -hmm. Dallas, Fort Worth, Texas, October 26, 1999. Since we're talking about pilots, there were two pilots who were eastbound they were captains of their uh, their aircraft, commercial aircraft. One was uh, Delta and the other was United. Mm -hmm. And they were both at about 30,000 feet headed east. One was headed to Delta, uh, to uh, Atlanta, Georgia. Yeah. The other to Miami, Florida, as I recall. And these aircraft were separated by probably five or ten miles, but both pilots were instantly their attention was instantly drawn to a huge fireball to the north of them that appeared to be coming directly at them and while they were both watching it the object suddenly turned from going to the south to going to the east they both estimated it took a fraction of a second for it to make the, to execute a approximately a 90 degree turn to the east and it shook them up uh, Peter Jennings, in his celebrated piece on UFOs called UFOs Seen is Believing, right, 2004. Both of those gentlemen. Oh, 
I'll have to remember yeah. that. Yeah, I'm sure we all saw it at the time. But what object's yeah. going to make a right angle turn? Certainly no natural phenomenon could do that. There's no chance, do you yeah. think? And it I, was, I would say uh, none. Both of them were shocked by it. Both of them called me independently of one another. And uh, I, as I recall, I got the... FAA video, or rather audio, on that that event, and it's Amazing. clear that both pilots were shaken by that. And you know, to people, I often get, uh, I, I roll my eyes from time to time when I hear people say things like, "Well, it's probably some military test that we've got," which I wouldn't dispute all of those uh, times when people say it, but. Aren't people curious about the technology that would be involved in being able to do that anyway? Like, if that was a military test, okay, fine. How in God's name could you make a big fireball? Uh, why would you have it come at two commercial airliners, first of all, at 30,000 feet, and then you have it make a 90-degree left turn? Really? I'd sure like to know what's the technology behind that. And, and that's where people's curiosity just seems to die. Like they just let it go and say, oh, well, it's just something that we're testing. And I just think that's maddening to me. Like this is fascinating. No matter who is making this, it, this is a fascinating question. But then, of course, we have to wonder, are we actually making these things? And another one would go, another question would be relating to the triangles, which I hear this all the time. You hear people saying, well, we're making triangles, which we may well be making triangles. I would never say no. But again, some of these triangle sightings are extraordinary, aren't they? And you've collected so many of those. Gobs of them. Yes. In fact, David Marler from Albuquerque has written a very nice book on the focusing on the subject of uh, apparently UFO craft, UFO type craft that are in triangle, triangular form. In fact, he's called to the attention of the UFO community that we probably, it, referring to these UFOs as flying saucers is a misnomer because two-thirds of them are triangular in shape. We should be calling them flying triangles. There's a lot of them. Well, I, I know Mar David's work because I published that book that you're referring to, and I think it's a oh, yeah. great book called The Estimate of the situation, um, and it's a fantastic book. So I recommend people check it out. But you have one triangle report that really grabbed my attention. You were nice enough to send me a list of some of uh, some of the cases that you were most intrigued by, and there's one from I think the year 2000. That uh, challenge. <laughs> yeah, can we talk a little bit about that? I'd love to talk about that. I could. I can almost read your mind and see where you're going, Richard, oh, yes. because you are correct. You've homed in on a, a truly, truly dramatic event. Chalice, Idaho, which is sort of central Idaho, nestled up against a mountain range. A group of four hunters from Bend, Oregon, had driven their uh, pickup trucks, and I'll mention why I mention that, uh, the type of vehicle in a moment, uh, drove their pickup trucks with their campers up to Chalice and went out to their hunting camp where at least one or two of them had hunted routinely every year for about 20 years, so they knew the area quite well. Mm -hmm. And one night they went up there to scout out populations of deer and elk. It was not yet hunting season, so all they could do was look at them and uh, photograph them for uh, the hunting season. Well, one night they were watching videos of the animals they had photographed and they decided to have a late dinner. It was about 9.30 or so, maybe nine o'clock. And one of the four of them went out to the vehicle to recover food from their storage locker. They didn't keep food in the campers because of the bear problem. And to make a long story short, he stepped up on the tire of his rear tire of his pickup to get the food out of the uh, tool locker or food locker. And as he stepped up, his flashlight swept across the sky and he immediately realized there was something directly above him. 
and he was so shaken by what he saw that he fell off the tire, landed on his back, and started screaming for the other three men to come out of the uh, camper. They did, just in time to see this huge triangular craft turn all of its lights on and start moving to the northeast. And they stood there in awe for several minutes as it slowly moved to a range of mountains, got to the mountain range and slowly tipped its nose up and slowly worked its way up the side of the mountain and went over the mountain. Uh, Wait, so it uh, actually uh, ascended to uh, kind of go over the mountain, as it were? Yes. That's interesting. And significantly ascended slowly. Mm -hmm. It was not being supported by aerodynamic forces. There, There was something else at work. Well, they were badly shaken. Two of the men, both brothers from Bend, Oregon, They've both spoken at UFO conferences at my request, uh, decided that they did not want to stay in that camp overnight with things like that above them. So they uh, loaded their rifles, their deer rifles, got in their pickup and drove into the nearest town, into Chalice, and rented a motel room that night. The next morning, they contacted the FAA and met with FAA representatives and gave them all the information they could and then drove back to the hunting camp. Just as they got back very close to the hunting camp, an F-16 went right over the hunting camp at very high speed on afterburner. Whether that was in any way related to the UFO event or not, UFO sighting is... Uh, hard to say. Mm-hmm. It was a dramatic event. Fascinating. The object, Did they get a, a sense they, of the size of this thing? Yes, it was bigger than a football field, as I recall. Maybe twice that size. It could have been a quarter mile on a side, but it was huge and it Massive. completely engulfed the hunting area, the hunting My camp. God. Just astonishing. We're yep. nearly out of time here. I wanted to ask you about orb sightings. I don't know if we'll have, I don't think we'll be able to get that in in this segment, unfortunately. We'll have to keep talking. But I do think uh, you've got a lot of thoughts on how people can, you know, report these objects in in the most efficient way. And it might be helpful just to take the last couple of minutes out in order to do that. What do you think? Yeah, I'd be happy to do that. The, the best way, most people I observe from 25 years of experience in this job want to talk and talk and talk and talk. They want to, I call it chit-chat about their UFO sighting. And all of that is very, very interesting information. But tragically, if talking about it is all they do, it doesn't achieve the objective, which is to capture the information. And in order to capture that information, it requires the written word people have to write down the details of their sighting and i'm constantly battling with people who just want to tell me the whole story trying to get them to write it down so we can post it to our website but the things we like to know are where were they located what was the time what was the date Uh, how long did they see the object how big did it look relative to a star or a planet or a a full moon, for example, most people compare it to the size of a barn or to the uh, size of a football field, but unfortunately that doesn't convey any meaningful information about Mm -hmm. it to the person who's uh, reading the report. But that's the best way to report it is in written form, and it's devilishly hard to get an American to write down the details of their UFO sighting. Writing? I mean, unless they can text it on their on their smartphone, no one's going to write it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, they, that's a bad joke. They, but oftentimes people true. want me to write their report for them. And I'm flattered by their trust in me to do so. But another person can't write a, a written account of what another person has seen. The actual witness, eyewitness, 
has to do that. That's right. You got to tell your own story, people. I've had a number of folks come up to me over the years who want me to write their life story. I just think, are you kidding me? First of all, your life's not that interesting. Secondly, do it yourself. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, uh, you, that's but, why we spend <laughs> trillions of dollars a year for K-12 education, so people are able to write. That's and right. Even if they can't write, their their computer can. Just, their spell checker can. Grammar check. Just suck it up, people, and do it. But I really think yep. it's a great idea. Uh, and you actually do collect an enormous number of these reports, so... Uh, your site is doing a great service. I do think your idea of the passive radar is indeed a great potential contribution for the future. And I would love to see that happen. But in the meantime, your website, uh, the National UFO Reporting Center, is an ab- absolutely undeniable contribution to this field. We're all in, very much in your debt, Peter, for running this website for so long. I wish we had more time in this segment, but you and I will continue in the next segment, which will be available on my website, Richard Olin Members. But for right now, I just I want to thank you, Peter, for being here with me. Well, thank you, Richard, and thank you for all your wonderful work. You're probably one of the most significant authors in the field of ufology who has ever existed. Mm-hmm. And the work you are doing is vastly more important than what I'm doing in the sense that you're recording the details and ferreting into what actually happened. So uh, Very kind. I return the compliment. Thank you. I want to thank you, the listener, for listening. I am Richard Dolan, and this is KGRA Radio. We will catch you next time. Let's keep fighting the good fight. Later.